This is the Project Management Podcast. We bring project management topics to beginners and experts. Find us on the web at www.thepmpodcast.com or send your emails to pmpodcast at gmail.com. Hello and welcome to episode number 51. I am Cornelius Fichtner. This is the Project Management Podcast for the 30th of September 2006. In today's show, we are going to continue our look at international and intercultural project management. A few episodes ago, we looked at the issues that a manager of a PMO in Sri Lanka was faced with in regards to all the customer requests that she gets. But what about on the other end? What about the customer? What issues does the customer face who has chosen to augment their staff through offshoring? This is the discussion that I had with Eric Smith, and I have to admit that I was genuinely surprised by what I found. Today's episode is once again sponsored by BOT International, the provider of processes on demand. PMO processes, policies and dashboards can be quite a bother to set up, institutionalize and maintain. BOT's Processes on Demand solves this problem by providing customizable project management processes and templates, PMO policies and dashboards, and integration features to PPM and collaboration applications such as Microsoft Project, Server and SharePoint. To learn more, please visit www.botinternational.com. Well, and you know, as always with our sponsors, please click on their banner on the pmpodcast.com so that they know that you found them through us. Now, let us move on. I have three announcements. Then we have a few helpful resources, some of your helpful resources, as a matter of fact. And then we'll head right into the interview. First announcement, of course, the book giveaway. I have received two copies of Introduction to IT Project Management. I have received that from Frank Parth, who was a previous guest on the uh, on the show here. And he has written Introduction to IT Project Management together with Cindy Snyder. And the book is touted as an easy to understand guidance for everyone in the IT project management environment. Well, and if you want to uh, win one of those two books, all you have to do is send an email to pmpodcast at gmail.com. In the subject line, write IT book. And in the body of the email, all you have to write is where you're from, the town and the country where you're from. Now, in the last episode, I said you'd have to send this email to me by the 10th of October. Don't know what I was thinking. Really don't know what I was thinking. Of course, it has to get to me by the 4th of October. I believe that is Wednesday, the 4th of October. So hop over to your keyboard and send off that email. My second announcement is about the change of our RSS feed. I've made this announcement a few times. It's going to happen on the 17th of October. All those of you who are using iTunes and those of you who go to the website and manually click on the episodes and listen through your browser, you don't have to worry at all. Everything should happen automatically for the people who are using iTunes. At the moment, when you open up iTunes and you look at the project manager, podcast, you'll probably see that it says the project management podcast and then brackets old feed. So if you see that, it's correct. If you don't see the old feed, that means you're already on the new feed. So that's perfect. I have already both feeds up. So no worries about this. I'm just continuing to make this announcement just in case that when you um, are subscribed on the, what is it, 20th of October and you're expecting another show to come down and there is nothing happening, well, then something may have gone wrong at your end and you'll have to go to the website and resubscribe to the podcast. At this point, it's just an announcement. Don't worry too much. It should all happen fully automatically. My last announcement is in regards to the poll that I have up on the website, and it asks the question, how do you listen to podcasts? One anonymous respondent wrote in his response with growing horror. Hmm, okay, so you don't like the Project Management Podcast. I'm okay with that. 
What I'm not okay with is the fact that by just writing writing with growing horror in an anonymous post, you're hiding. You're hiding yourself behind an anonymous comment. If there is something you don't like about the program, tell it to my face. Because if I don't know what you don't like and if I cannot discuss it with you, I cannot make a change and improve the program. Therefore, Here's my call to action to all those of you who have suggestions for improvements. Tell me what you don't like on this program and also don't forget to tell me how you would like to see it change. Because, as we all know, negative feedback should always contain suggestions for improvement. Write to me at pmpodcast at gmail.com, you know the email address, and uh, well, since we're all project managers here, we will be putting in place a podcast improvement process. And now, let's move on with the helpful resources. We are continuing our helpful resources section with recommendations that listeners have sent in. So this is actually your helpful resources section now. In today's episode, I have three listeners who have sent in a bunch of recommendations. And we start out with Jerry Manis. Jerry Manis, of course, is the the Jerry Manis who does the Jerry Manis Monthly Project Management Podcast series. And if you haven't checked him out, find him on iTunes and subscribe to his podcast. He writes, Cornelius, there are so many good websites out there and resources out there, it's hard to choose. I list one for each of three categories. For pure project management knowledge, facts and usable tips, I always refer to maxweidman.com. Max is like the godfather of project management. Yes, and we've had him on the show last week. The amount of practical, concise content there is staggering. This is the one I'd take with me if I had to manage a giant project on a deserted island and had a laptop laptop with only one URL available. Okay, so this is an implausible example. (laughs) For project management and edutainment, he recommends that having done a program on AllPM at AllPM.com, I've been very impressed with their variety and amount of content and willingness to take risks, especially now that they have revamped their homepage. I think it's a valuable site. If I had to choose my overall favorite leadership management website, on the other hand, I'd have to say that the Tom Peters website at TomPeters.com is it. As a writer, researcher and independent consultant, I always find something there to inspire me. Besides the blogs and rants, he shares his white papers, PowerPoint slides, links to unique sites and more. It's like a feast for the senses for someone into leadership, talent and innovation. It is also a hearty up yours to the status quo, which I can always get behind. Regards, Jerry Manis. All right, so Jerry gives us three, Max Whiteman, allpm.com, and uh, where is it? TomPeters.com. Next, we have Eduardo Pimazzoni, and he writes, I am happy to indicate an amazing project management website to our friends and listeners of the Project Management Podcast. It is called Lifelong Project, and it's at blog.lifelongproject.com. This is a particular site from a PMP colleague which knows how to build a project for your ongoing life. The way that he describes himself and how he talks about the life project is very interesting. Maybe some of you already know this website, maybe not. I hope you all uh, enjoy as I do very often. Best regards, this is from Eduardo P- uh, Pimazzoni, he's a PMP, writing to us from San Paolo, Sao Paulo, Brazil. And finally, we have a recommendation from Scott Ostrom. Scott writes, HP does a great deal of ITIL projects, and I thought that this particular podcast was profound. And the podcast that he recommends is the one that the PMI IS SIG, the episode that the PMI IS SIG recently released about ITIL and the PMBOK. 
He continues, I have emailed out links to your project management website to many of the PMs within HP. But I felt that this specific podcast from the PMI IS SIG focused on what many IT companies are striving for. It combines the concept of ITIL with project management. I hope you all find the time to listen to it. Best regards, Scott Ostrom. And I think he is from Virginia in the USA. As always, you can find these recommendations from our listeners in the helpful resources section at thepmpodcast.com. And yes, if you would like to share your favorite website, all it takes is sending an email to pmpodcast at gmail.com. Tell me the URL of the website and explain to me why you like it and, of course, where you're writing writing from. And I will pass on your recommendation here on the show. And now for today's interview with Eric Smith. As so many project managers in software development, Eric started out as a software developer and he now works as a software development project manager for one of the oldest financial service providers in the United States. Some time back, His company announced plans to offshore portions of their software development efforts through staff augmentation. Eric and I will be discussing the impact this announcement had and how he manages projects with a global team. The Project Management Podcasts Feature Interview Today with Eric Smith, Software Development Project Manager. Fellow project managers, I'm sitting here in the office of Eric Smith, and we will be talking about software development offshore projects. Welcome to the program, Eric. Thank you for the invitation. Well, absolutely. I'm glad to have you, really. Um, How long have you been a development project manager? My background is development, so I've been a developer for 15 years, but really in project management, I've been about five years in project manager. All right. And how long have you dealt with offshoring projects? About two years. About two years. And how did that happen? How did that come to be? It came about because the company that I work for, we, as a corporate goal, they wanted to do more offshoring. They wanted to utilize resources. Started out in India, where they wanted to start out uh, developing and using offshore resources. Was there any particular reason why they wanted to use offshore resources? I think most people use offshoring resources for the same reason we did. It's for costs. The costs are, uh, at least on paper, they look very, very beneficial. Yes. It's about a third the cost of a standard developer here in the United States. So I think the, the primary reason was costs. I also believe, and in, in what I have come to find, is that there are similar skills between the people that are working offshore and those that are working here. So the skill sets are, are, they can be different, but I have found for some of the projects that I have had that it's been comparable across development resources Mm -hmm. here and in India. Okay. How many developers do work for you offshore? I have five and a half, actually (laughs) six and a half. (laughs) And, and I'll talk a little bit more about this later, but uh, I'm in the process of replacing one of my contractors, one of the offshore contractors, okay. uh, due to some issues that we've had. So I'll, I'll talk a little bit about that. So it's timely that we're doing this interview. Yeah. Now, the time difference between here, California, and India is about 12, 13 hours, right? It's right in the middle there. It's 12 and, 12 and a half, half. hours. Okay. I haven't never been able to figure out why that half hour yeah. is in there, but it is 12 and a half. So do your offshore resources work during their day or during our day? I've had them work both. Typically, they work during their day, which means that they come in somewhere around 9 p.m. my time and then leave somewhere in the early morning. But I have had experiences where I've asked them to work late. Mm -hmm. So, in fact, my main development team, which is the trade management team, they work um, 
late two days a week so that we can have conference calls and video conference so that we can talk and get status and, and really get down to the nuts and bolts of discussion between the, the two continents. Since you still have your resources here, the reason why it was chosen to have uh, resources in India is therefore not a staff replacement, but it's a staff augmentation, right? Yeah, there, there's there's two ways to look at offshoring. Uh, some some particularly developers, some look at it as very negative. A lot of people have had bad experiences with it, and I think that most of those companies do staff replacement. Whereas here at the company that I work for, we have done staff augmentation, which means that's an increase. You take the core development staff that you have now, and then you add on to that so that it just helps the entire team do a better job together. Mm -hmm. So yeah, it's a good point that you bring up that we do staff augmentation here. So instead of employing people here, you employ people in India in your case. Yeah, and, and, and in some cases, what I have found is as we have naturally had attrition in my team locally, we will take on sometimes a development resource from offshore. But other teams here where I work, they've actually increased their local staff in addition to increasing their offshore staff. Okay. So <clears throat> again, I know people, Some a lot of people, when they hear about offshoring, they're very scared about it because they don't know how it's going to impact their jobs. And it really depends on executive management on how they're interacting with their employees, both offshore and onshore, because it, it because of the cost benefits, mm-hmm. executive management often does look at it as a staff replacement so that they can gain some really big cost benefit. What was the initial reaction like then of your onshore people when it was announced two years ago, hey, we're going to have staff augmentation with offshoring resources? What was that like? Well, we didn't actually present it as a, as staff augmentation because we really didn't know uh, wh- how it was going to work. So there was a lot of anxiety among the mm-hmm. local development staff. A lot of anxiety, concern, just generally it wasn't very pleasant for a little while there. But as we've got into it, as people have become accustomed to it, as they have realized the executive management, what they have said is accurate, people have started to adopt it and feel more comfortable mm-hmm. with it. And I certainly as a manager have, have come to like offshoring in many ways. In what ways? I, I think that the biggest benefit to me has been that you can have a 24-hour development shop. So if you're trying to produce something very quickly, which in my group we often are doing something very quickly, we want to turn something around, I can have people develop from 7 a.m. Pacific time until 6 or 7 p.m. Pacific, and then they walk in the door at 9, and they take over from 9 p.m. until 6 in the morning. So they literally, if there's something that needs to be done around the clock, it literally can be done, and I don't need to have somebody here killing themselves for 24 hours straight. So both your turnaround time have shortened and your throughput have increased then? Yeah, and my costs have decreased. Your costs have decreased. Yeah. Would you consider that an additional benefit then? Yeah, of course. Yeah, It is a benefit. I think, I guess the one thing that I would tell people who are considering it is the you can't just consider the cost as the total cost. Mm-hmm. There's opportunity costs that are that you forego by having offshore resources, and there are other problems that you encounter by having offshore development resources. In other words, if the, co- if the raw cost of a development resource is a third, I would say the amount of documentation, additional documentation that's required, the amount of additional project management, the amount of additional communication with offshoring, mm-hmm. all of that increases. So there there are some pain points that you must consider. And therefore, the I think the total cost of having offshoring is much higher than a third. I don't think it's 100%. I, I really, I know some people have said that, but I personally believe that it's probably about two thirds. Mm-hmm. That's just off the top of my head. But right. I... I there are some costs that you must incur just as a matter of course in the way you do business after you have offshoring. But if I hear you right, even if it's two-third, you have additional resources. Instead of one person, you may have two people working on your team additionally. You have the opportunity of having almost a 24-hour-a-day shop. Yep. You have increased uh, throughput 
and you have slightly reduced cost. I mean, it sounds sounds like a great benefit. It, 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 it is. There are some really good benefits to it. That's absolutely true. Okay. Now, I know that your offshoring company also has onshore resources that work directly here in your offices. What is their responsibility? It's twofold. One is to utilize resources onshore at a lower cost. So they're actually doing work here. But the other the other task that they have is to work with the offshoring offshore developers. Mm -hmm. So one of the pain points is that when you set up an infrastructure for offshore resources, particularly in the financial services industry, which I work in, there's some audit points that have to be accounted for. You can't have them on your network you, directly. You can't have them without, you know, we have additional firewalls in place and other things that are in the way that just make sure that if something were to happen with the offshore resources where somebody got onto our network and started deleting data for whatever reason, we have to have additional uh, pieces in place to make sure that that type of thing does not happen. So their main function then is communication between the two groups? It, it, it is partly. It's partly communication, um, working out some of those pain points. Right. If, if somebody wants to deploy code, they often have to do it with somebody onshore. So that they will often work with them in the middle of the night when they need help so that my development staff, my full-time development staff, don't have to do that. So that is that that is one part of it. But they also do work on on shore for projects that are in underway. If you had to pick one of those pain points that you mentioned, which one would you say is your top one that comes back again and again and again? Communication. Okay. Communication is extremely painful on multiple levels. Uh, and again, this is just my experience, so I can just speak from from my frame of reference. But communication has been very difficult simply because they're 12 and a half hours ahead is one part of it. Mm -hmm. Finding the opportunity to have a conversation is difficult because they have to work off hours in their time zone to be able to talk to me in my morning. My mornings tend to be the most busy. So I, I sometimes have to ditch my meeting with the offshore developers because I, I have a a production issue that's come up or something else has, has come up that doesn't allow me to have the conversation. And the other thing that I have found is that I'm not sure if it's a cultural issue or if it's just the people that I have encountered, but the Indian offshore developers tend not to communicate as well as people that are on my staff. I know there's the distance problem, but the reason that I have six and a half develop developers right now that are offshore is because I'm letting go one that has not communicated well, and he's been onshore. He's been right outside my office. He sits in the cube right outside my office. So communication has definitely been the most difficult for th thing for me to deal with. Is it also a question of uh, them not being native English speakers? They're, they're <laughs> that's a really good point. Yes, it is sometimes very difficult to understand. In fact, when I brought in one of the offshore people, I made it a requirement that he attend English class because I could not understand him. So he did go through some English classes and understood and could communicate a little bit better, but it's always a struggle. And as a manager, sometimes I have to recapitulate what they tell me just so I can say, is that what you said? You know, that type of thing. And it's sometimes awkward. Okay. Now, out of the others, uh, pain points that you've had, what other would you say are, are recurring issues? Well, one of the things that happens with offshore developers is they're, they're often away from their families. Their families are often in India. So when they take vacation, they usually take four weeks and go back to India and they stay for four weeks. Well, anyone that has a development staff knows that four weeks is a very long time to have someone gone, particularly if you're in the midst of a difficult or consuming project. That's been one. Visas are often difficult in our post 9-11 days. It's, it's hard for them to get visas. It's, it's painful. It takes a lot of time. Uh, it's Appointments with the consulate in India get changed at the last minute. So that that's another issue that comes up. But again, I would say communication is, is, is probably the most difficult one. Mm. So 
most of what I'm hearing you say is it's usually not the project-related issues. It's outside issues that seem to be causing problems. Yeah, no, that's a good assessment. Like I said, I think the skill sets that they bring to the table are similar. Not always, but similar to... If you have a project, you have a Java project or a C++ project, you need somebody to code something, you give them a spec that tells them exactly what they need to do, they'll get it done. Okay. And then they're responsive. So yes, it's it, it usually has not been an issue with delivery. They work hard. They will work extra hours if they need to. They don't have any issues with that. And the skill sets tend to be about the same. Mm-hmm. So yeah, it is mostly the external influences and and project management that becomes the most difficult part of it. Let's go back two years when your company announced, hey, we're going to do this, we're going to augment our staff with offshoring resources. Did they give you any training in regards to how your position was going to change, how your management style would have to change? They didn't here at the company that I work for. How did you then educate yourself? On the job. On the job. On the job training. And and it has been a painful process in some ways. You know, you, you, I've tried a certain type of communication for a while that didn't work. I switched it to another uh, flavor. So just as an example, as, as some people who are listening may have to go through this, I at first just tried to communicate via email primarily and have one-off phone calls. That did not work at all. Then I started having to call every night at 9 o'clock Pacific time to talk to them when they started their day and I had it every day me I, as the project manager one of the key analysts that worked with them at day in day out here from onshore would call in from home and then the development staff in India would call in that to me that was the most effective about six months ago now we changed it so that I have a call with them twice a week in the morning so they work the late shift as I mentioned earlier I, I have found that that's not as effective, mm-hmm. and it, it does cause problems at some points. But it's also easier for me, so I don't of have course, to be on the yes. call at 9 o'clock every night. Yeah. Have you made use of video conferencing at all? Yes. That was that was actually probably the biggest mistake that we made out the gate is we, I did not use video conferencing. I used it very little. And in the past six months, I've started using it quite a bit more, having team meetings both with developers and analysts onshore as well as the development staff offshore, and, and video conference does help that. So you do it every week, those two calls, or um, how, do you, how do you switch it around? Well, I, we have a, a, a phone call twice a week, and then we do the video conference every couple of weeks. So the whole, actually it's every three weeks, the whole team gets together and does a video conference. Mm. And I, I'm mostly focusing on one development team just so it doesn't get complicated. I actually have three development development teams that work offshore, and I have a slightly different arrangement with them, but it, it's it's similar. Since you didn't get any training in all of this, did you buy any books? Did you educate yourself uh, on the web? Any resources you could recommend? I talked to a lot of people who had done offshoring, but I didn't read any books about it. And I I just approached it for myself and the company that I worked with. So Mm -hmm. no, there wasn't anything that I did as far as training. If you compare the first project that you did to a project that you're doing today, what would you say the major differences are in how you're handling it? Well, I'm a lot more knowledgeable in that way. (laughs) The the video conferencing has, has been one change and the the communication, having daily communication, and then allowing the, there is an onshore project manager for the offshoring company. Yes. There's a, there's, there's a, basically a project manager from the offshoring company that we work, who works here on site. And I've worked with him a lot more over the past year. That's an, another big difference between when we started and what's happening now. It sounds like your communication needs have increased manifold. I don't know if the needs have increased manifold, but my rec- my recognition that it needs to be better has, has increased manifold. Yeah, I, I agree with that. All right. Did you in these projects encounter any cultural differences that led to friction on the team? You know, I, I would like to say that the people that I have worked with, both from 
onshore and offshore, those resources have been fantastic people. And they, as with anyone, you bring a different culture, a different background, a different experience to the workplace. And I have found it to be really fun to work with them, to learn from them, to hear about the cultural differences between our society and theirs, because there are a lot of differences. The way that they are raised, their educational backgrounds are very different. So from that experience, it's been really unique and an interesting experience to, to blend that culture with ours. And in a world which is so focused on diversity nowadays, it really has been beneficial to the entire team. If you weigh the good and the bad that you've seen in all these projects with the offshoring resources, where would you say the needle points to? Cornelius, that's a really good question. It's, it's one that I have asked myself several times over the past couple of years. There have been times when I have said, offshoring is a really bad idea. I don't care how much money you're saving. It doesn't, it doesn't save you in communication and time and pain of having to replace a resource. For example, the, the, the pain point that I'm going through right now of having to replace a offshore, an onshore contractor who is with the offshoring company. It's painful. But there have been many times when I have the 24 hours, the development cycle, where I think this is really cool. This is really beneficial to have this experience and to be able to utilize resources both onshore and offshore. I, I have also been fortunate in that executive management has created a, a staff augmentation, and I think that makes a huge difference because I don't have to worry about my local team being having anxiety every day coming to work. They don't have that anxiety anymore. They know that they are staff augmentation. I think for companies that do staff replacement, I think it's a bad idea. Straight out, I think it would be a horrible idea because there's so much pain involved. The money isn't that beneficial. And, and I, don't, I, I just don't see the benefit of doing it that way. But I think that I, I have seen the way that I have seen it has been beneficial. So yeah. I, I think in, in my scenario, I would do it again. Now, in conclusion, what suggestions would you give to a project manager who is just starting out uh, on an offshoring project, has his first offshoring team, what should they look for? How should they lead the project? Well, first, I would make sure that they bring a lot of patience to the table and that they uh, work on their communication skills. Not because Remember that because you're working with offshore resources, unless you use a lot of video conference, and you can use a lot of video conference, a lot of the conversations are going on over the phone, so you can't pick up on the nuances of talking to someone across the table and picking up on their facial expressions. It's hard to do that with your working with offshore. So being able to communicate both through your written documentation as well as your informal and formal meetings is really critical. So making sure that those are concise and that you have a plan in place is really important. And I would make it perfectly clear if to, to staff around you, your full-time development staff, that it is staff augmentation if that is indeed your path because it makes a huge difference to be able to have the whole team be on the same page from the beginning. Thank you. Shall we move on to the final 10 questions, the same 10 I ask everyone at Absol the end of these interviews? Absolutely. All right. I always have to cheat here. Number one, what was your favorite project? I think my favorite project has been STP, mm -hmm. at least at my current company. That's a straight through processing that we've done in the financial services. And that's really why I was brought on to deliver STP and its increased uh, automation of the entire project. The offshoring team hasn't worked on that too much. Number two, what project would you like to have managed and any project you want, really? I'm looking forward to working on the derivatives processing package that they're putting together right now. Okay. Number three. What is your favorite project management book? Oh, boy. I don't really have a favorite project management book, but I did read uh, Jack Walsh's book, mm -hmm. Winning. I think it's excellent. Number four, what is the topic of the next seminar that you're planning to attend? I don't have one. Uh, actually, I, I am going to attend a derivative seminar. Okay. Yeah, based on the business. Number five, what is the best way to make a project fail? Don't deliver. Number six, how do you like to celebrate a successful project? 
I personally love to give my team kudos because I know that it's not me that's it's not me that's delivering a successful project. It's the team that's around me. So I like taking people, uh, the team out to Dave and Buster's or doing some other uh, some other way to help my team feel that they did a great job. Number seven, in your projects, where do you focus most of your attention in order to be successful? Communication. Yeah, I mean, that, could have guessed that one. <laughs> yeah, I mean, that, that happens both offshoring or otherwise, yeah. Number eight, if you weren't a project manager, what would you like to be? I'd like to be a real estate broker. I'd make a lot more money. <laughs> <laughs> Number nine, what is the one thing that a project manager cannot live without? A good team. And finally... Number 10, the oldest question in project management. What is more important in a project manager, project management expertise or industry expertise? I would say project management expertise. You can apply that to any industry. Mm. Well, thank you so much for having given us your time here on the show today and spoken to us about offshoring projects. Appreciate it. Yeah, thank you. And if anyone has any questions, they're, they're more than willing to follow up with me after. I appreciate the opportunity. And that was the interview with Eric Smith on staff augmentation through offshoring. Let me remind you again that you can find links to all the books that our interview guests recommend in the helpful resources section of the pmpodcast.com. Tune in again next week when we will speak with Bas de Bar on the topic, surprise, now you're a software project manager. That's it for today. Thank you very much for listening. As always, you can find us on the web at thepmpodcast.com or send your emails to pmpodcast at gmail.com. And when you write, yes, please don't forget to tell me where in the world you are writing from. And when you stop by at thepmpodcast.com, please don't forget to click on the link labeled PM templates to increase your productivity. These are best practice templates that will benefit your project. And um, before we go, I have one final announcement. I will be at the PMI Leadership Meeting in Seattle from October 18th to the 21st. I'm not quite sure if I'm even going to put out an episode on the 20th, Saturday the 20th. Nevertheless, if you are also attending that particular seminar, please drop me a line and we can do an interview right there in person. And finally, we have this. A quote from Jason Fried the, in his keynote speech at the South by Southwest Festival 2006. And Jason says, Projections are bullshit. They're just guesses. Wait until the real thing happens. And then, when it happens, then you can make the decision. Make decisions when you have a lot of information to make the decisions. Not when you have to guess about what the decision is going to be or use data that doesn't exist yet. Well, that's food for thought on your projects right there. Until next time.